Hey, welcome everybody. It's Marcus Schubert here tonight. I'm coming to you from Perth, Western Australia, but I'm actually based on the Gold Coast. Been 12 months here in Jeunesse. It's been exciting. Uh, I was formerly the number one income earner for my past company, and I just could not be happier being uh, here with Jeunesse and to see what's going on, to be part of the fastest growing network marketing company listed the last two years running the fastest company to do a billion dollars ever in the direct selling industry, and we just are unstoppable right now. So tonight what I want to do is to give you some techniques and some information and some skills that you can go out and actually use immediately to make an impact in your business and you can also utilize some of these formulas which I'll be teaching you tonight to actually teach your team. They're very simple concepts but very powerful. So as you can see on the screen, we're going to first off uh, talk about how effective are you within your network marketing business. We're going to move on to what is your job description. The biggest lie in network marketing will move on to how to open your prospect's mind, what to say to prospects, what not to say to prospects, and then we're going to finish up with five magic words you can use that will work every single time, and then five words that you should not use because they'll probably won't work every single time. So if it's okay with you guys, we'd like to dive straight in, starting out with how effective are you. The first thing to understand is that we are in a skills-based business. Now, there's an upside and a downside to this. The downside is if the business isn't going as well as we would like to, it's pretty much our fault. <laughs> no one's stopping us from, from actually learning these skills. But the good news is nobody's stopping us from learning these skills. So that really should empower you to feel like that you are in the driver's seat of your business and it's really a matter of learning and developing these skills so that you can become a network marketing professional. The second aspect to think about is that we're actually involved in a people business. You know, we're not in the skincare business or the nutrition business or the weight loss business. You know, they are products that we offer to the world, but we're not talking to those products every single day. We don't talk to skincare products. We're actually out there talking to people. So unless we have an effective level of skills, where we can deal with people in a way where we actually can have them understand that we have something to provide them that can uh, provide a solution to the challenges they have or the exciting dreams that they have. We're really not going to be effective. It doesn't matter how good we are at product knowledge. Um, it's really about dealing with people. Now, it's interesting, back in 2015, September, I was fortunate to be in a private luncheon with Les Brown. Now, if you guys not, haven't heard of Les Brown, um, you know, he's one of the most, uh, I guess, well-known public speakers and authors around the world. And, you know, I thought I was asking him a smart question because in the business I was in previously, a lot of people talked about our products and they were very product-centric, very product-focused. And the outcome of that was that they ended up with a lot of customers in their business, but they really didn't have too many people who were there um, building the business and wanting to build a business. So I thought I was asking Les this smart question, so I put up my hand and I said, Les, you know, there's a bit of a debate. Some people think you should lead with product, other people think you should lead with opportunity. Um, what would you say to that? And Les said, well, actually, neither. You should lead with you, because if people don't like you, if they don't buy you, if they don't trust you, it doesn't matter how good your products are or how good your opportunity is, they're not going to do business with you at all. And I thought, man, that's why you've made $40 million. And, and that's a real, um, uh, I guess, a take-home message for all of us is that the more we can work on ourselves and becoming a likable person and somebody that others want to be around, others want to do business with, that's really going to have a huge impact on our business as we go forward. So the next question is, well, how are you being a networker? Now, it's interesting. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine. He's a mentor. And it was um, you know, maybe about six, eight months ago. And we were talking about life, and he asked me this question. Uh, we were talking about, you know, how energy affects things in, in the way we're doing things. And he said, Marcus, let's say you were a bus driver. How would you be doing that? And I thought, well, I don't know. What do you mean, how would I be doing that? I'm, I'm sort of almost got frustrated. I thought, well, I don't know. I'd be just sitting there. I'd be steering the bus. I'd be opening the door. Um, that's how I'd be doing it, changing gears. And he said, well, let me give you an example. Let's say there's three different bus drivers. Uh, or three different networkers. They've all got the same job. So bus driver number one, he's Mr. Grumpy. Um, he's telling the kids to sit down, to be quiet. He's got a, an angry look on his face. Um, the kids are not really enjoying it. Um, and that's really how he is being a bus driver. 
The second bus driver, he's Mr. Happy. He's having a good time, he's laughing, he's smiling, he knows all the kids by name, the kids are having a great time, and they're really enjoying being on his bus, and he's enjoying driving the bus. And then the third bus driver, he's Mr. Safety. He's not angry, he's not happy, he's just conservative, he thinks his job is to get the kids to school on time and in a safe manner. Now, all three people are being a bus driver. And so the question is, if you are being a network marketer, how are you doing that? And who wants to be on your bus? Because well, I think we would all agree we don't want to be on Mr. Grumpy's bus. <laughs> Mr. Safety bus, well, that might be cool and, and it's safe, but it's probably not that much fun. So, you know, just think about how are you feeling during the process of building your business? Because if you're getting frustrated with yourself, you're getting frustrated with prospects, you're blaming your upline, you're blaming the company, you know, the product turns up and the box is a little bit crushed and, and all you're doing is focusing on problems, it's probably going to be not a fun journey for you throughout your network marketing career. Now, as far as your level of effectiveness within the industry, I developed this concept a few years ago called the belief bucket. Now, the concept of the belief bucket is that we all have a different capacity that we can fulfill within the network marketing industry. And if we actually fill our bucket to the top with water, it means we've fulfilled our capacity within the network marketing industry. We all have a different size bucket, but the good news is as we grow, the bucket can grow as well. Now, right now, or a bit later on, you can rate yourself very quickly from 1 to 10 as to what is your level of belief in the products that we have. You can rate your level of belief from 1 to 10 in the company. Do you believe the company is doing a good job and you rely on and, and you're proud of the management team and the corporate staff? What's your level of belief in the network marketing industry? Do you believe it's a great profession? Are you proud of being involved in it? Do you believe that people are looking for and wanting to and will get involved in the industry? Do you believe it's growing and it's actually an industry that you can be a part of and proud of? Rate yourself from 1 to 10. 10 being the best, 1 being the lowest. Number 4. What's your level of belief in yourself? You know, how, I mean, because you might be sitting there thinking, well, I think Marcus can be good at this. I think Angela can be good at this, and Craig and Aaron and Brody and Lyndon. I think they can be all good at it, but I don't know if I can be good at it. Now, the concept of the belief bucket is obviously we're trying to fill this bucket to the top. Now, what happens is if we rate our level of belief in the products, let's say it's an 8 out of 10, we drill a hole 80% the way up the bucket. Now, if we've rated our level of belief in the company at a 7, we drill a hole 70% the way up the bucket, and then, of course, the industry and ourself. So what you want to do is look at the numbers as you've rated your level of belief, and the lowest number is actually the most critical because that is your limiting factor. If you're trying to fill that bucket full of water, it's always going to only get as high as the lowest belief. So if in this example, if your belief in yourself is low, well, you know, that doesn't matter then how amazing you think the products are. I mean, I've met people in network marketing who they, they just, um, you know, could tell you the ingredients from left to right and in alphabetical order and talk to you about the science and how to apply the product and how much it costs and everything about the product. They absolutely could go to war about, uh, you know, how amazing their product is. But they're often struggling to build a business and oftentimes that's because they lack belief in the company, the industry, or themselves. And I found from my research over the years that majority of people, their lowest numbers are either about themselves or about the network marketing industry. So the good news is, first of all, we need to know that we need to focus on that lowest number. And the things you can do to improve your level of belief, I mean, if it's in product, just use more product. That's an easy one. Um, if you lack belief in the company, you need to get on a plane and you need to fly to the head office and check the company out. Or you need to attend the Australian New Zealand conference or an international conference coming up so that you can see and get to hear from the corporate staff so you can see who's running this company. And really attending an event a major event is the best way possible to increase your level of belief in all of these areas because you're going to see people talking about their product experiences. You're going to see people having success in the company. So you're going to believe in the industry more because you're going to see people in front of your very eyes 
who are having success through network marketing. You're going to get to see that the company is providing a platform um, for these people to succeed and they're releasing new products, releasing new marketing tools. And then you'll also have a belief growth level in yourself because you'll see and hear from other people who have similar stories and background to yourself. And this is why events are so important. They're non-negotiable and you know what, it's just one of those things where you need to draw a line in the sand and say to yourself, listen, am I really serious about this business or not? And if I am, events are non-negotiable. So let's move on to what is your job description. And it's funny, you know, we can do a, um, a role play in a room full of 100 people a hundred network marketers, even from ten different companies, and I can ask them, what would you say within 30 seconds is your job description? And you'll get so many different answers. You almost get a different answer from every single person. But here's the challenge. If you bring a new distributor into your business, they need to know what is their job description. Because if you don't tell them what their job description is, they'll go out and they'll do a ton of work that does not produce income They'll get frustrated, they'll get disappointed, they'll say it doesn't work, and eventually they will quit. And you know, that's no different to you know the, the normal corporate world. If you went into a company and you got a job as the accountant, but you weren't told what your job description was, and you went out and started knocking on doors and trying to create sales for the company, and you went and emptied the bins and cleaned the toilets and jumped on the phones and answered the phones at reception all day, you could work your butt off all year long. And at the end of the year, your boss turns around and says, you know what, you're fired. In fact, not only fired, we're not going to pay you. And you're being like, what the hell's going on? I worked my butt off for you. I put in everything I could. In fact, some days I stayed back and I emptied the trash and I cleaned up people's cubicles. But that's not your job. So within network marketing, we need to understand what our job is and what it's not. And we need to tell our distributors what their job is, otherwise they'll put all their energy into the wrong activities and wonder why they're not getting results. So in a very simple term, our job description as a network marketing distributor, if you're wanting to grow a business, is to simply do one thing, and that is to help people make decisions. Now we need to help people decide do they want to see a presentation. We need to help them decide that they want to talk to one of our business partners on a three-way phone call. We need to help them decide that they're going to attend a meeting, but ultimately we're helping people decide would they like to become a customer and use our products or would they like to become a distributor. That's it. The company pretty much does everything else. We don't need to worry about that. They take care of product development, the shipping, they take care of paying commissions, they take care of all the legal product registrations, business registrations, customer service, they provide a website, they even provide presentations and videos and marketing materials and product brochures. That's their job. Our job is to help people make decisions. That's the only thing the company does not do. So if we're not helping people make decisions, we're not making money. So there's three critical attributes we do need to become successful in the network marketing industry, but in fact you can't teach the first two. You need to bring these to the table yourself and your team members need to bring this to the table themselves. Now the first one is a reasonably good attitude. You can't teach somebody how to have a good attitude and if someone's got a good attitude, generally they're going to be self-motivated. They're prepared to do the work. They're prepared to be consistent. But again, yes, you can short-term motivate people, but we've all been to motivational seminars and then you walk out of it and two, three days later, you're back to where you were. So how really effective was that? So you can't teach people how to have a good attitude and how to be motivated. But what we do need to teach people is the skill set for network marketing. Now, you're probably wondering what this picture is on the bottom right hand side. It's a picture of a cockpit or an airplane. And I wanted to use this as an analogy because imagine you wanted to be a pilot. And uh, I said to you, well, you know, you just need to have a good attitude. Now, so you jump in the cockpit with all these buttons and bells and whistles and lights and gadgets and knobs and pulleys and everything. Does having a good attitude help you to fly the airplane? Probably not. Well, I say, you know what, you just need to go and read some books and attend some seminars and you need to be more motivated. So does being more motivated, is that going to help you to effectively fly the airplane? Probably not. What about, I say, you need to make a vision board, you know, of you flying an airplane. So you go make up your vision board 
and you sit in the cockpit the next day, are you now able to take that aeroplane safely up in the air with passengers and land it? Not at all. Well, okay, you need to do affirmations. Every day you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you say, I am a pilot. <laughs> I am a pilot. No, that doesn't help you either. Now, I'm not saying these things are not important. All the things I just mentioned are very important to help to program your subconscious mind for success. They're all important. But if you are not taught the correct skills to fly that aeroplane and given the opportunity to practice those skills in a safe uh, simulator, you know what? You're never going to be able to fly an aeroplane. You don't want to risk your life or the life of all the passengers. So we need to understand this. Now, it's really important that we have these skills because we need to understand, first of all, that most people are conditioned to be terrible at making decisions. And this is why it's even more important we understand what our job is. Now, if you don't believe me that people are terrible at making decisions, let's look at a few case studies here. Think about the last time you went out with a group of friends to a restaurant. You're sitting there, you're looking at the menu, and everyone's looking at each other going, oh, what are you going to have? I don't know. What are you going to have? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. What are you going to have? And then finally, someone makes a decision. Someone says, well, I'm going to have the duck. That looks really good. And immediately, everyone zeroes in. Oh, where's that on the menu? They look at it. Oh, that looks good. And at least one or two other people order exactly the same dish because somebody finally made a decision. Now what about this? As kids, we weren't really put in a position to make decisions. When we were young, whoever, who remembers yelling out, Mom, I'm thirsty. <laughs> can I get a drink? Or I'm hungry. When can I have something to eat? When you're a kid, you end up, I remember at one point saying, Mom, when can I choose my own clothes to wear? She goes, when you're an adult, you can choose your own. I'm thinking, great, I can't wait. And then we ask, can I have a day off of school? And of course, if we want to have a day off of school, we've got to turn up the next day from, with a note from our parents saying why we had a day off school. Then of course, um, if we're sitting at school when we're great at our schoolwork and we finish early, we go to the teacher, hey, I've finished my work, can I go home early? No, you've got to wait until the school day's finished and then you can go home. So then we go, well, when can I go on holidays and how long can I go? Well, you know, at the end of the year, you get to go on a holiday, school holidays. Um, and then you think, well, mum, how much can pocket money can I get paid? So we're not making any of these decisions, typically as a child. And then we wonder, let's actually go back to that, to that list. We get to an adult, look at that list, the very first one. Can I get a drink? Well, if you're at work, when are you allowed to go and have lunch? Well, typically most people don't decide that. They get given a lunch hour or half hour. What about what clothes can I wear? Some people have a job where they're given a uniform and they don't get to choose still. When can they have a day off for work? A lot of people can't even choose to have a day off for work. If they do, they have to have a note from a doctor. It's graduated from your parents to the doctor. And then you talk about, well, I've finished my work for the day. Can I go home? No, you have to stay till 5 o'clock, regardless of how productive you were. Well, what about can I go on holidays? Do you just say this is when I'm going or do you have to apply and ask permission when you can go on holidays and for how long? And what about how much do we get paid? Do we say, right, I think I'd like to be paid this much? Or do they decide and tell you how much the job is worth? So ultimately throughout our entire lives, a lot of our decisions are made for us. And this is important for us to understand because we then start talking to prospects about our business and we wonder why they see a fantastic presentation. We know the product can help them. We know the business can help them. And they sit there and go, well, I just need to think about it. And you're thinking, what the heck? Didn't you see the presentation? So we need to help them at that very point in time to make a decision. All right, we need to get out the product packs. We need to ask them what interested them the most and help them to actually make a decision. Now, the biggest lie most of, us, most of us get told in network marketing is this one right here. We get into the business and our sponsor or our outline or you go to a training, they say, you just need to go out and talk to people. You know, I've been in situations where I've gone out and talked to people and I talked to 50, 100, 200 people and hardly anybody joined. So I was doing what I was told and what I thought my job description was, but I wasn't having success. How many people, how many of you guys have got people in your team who go, I talk to everybody I know and no one's interested. 
and you're thinking, how the heck can that happen? How can you talk to everybody you know and nobody wants more time, nobody wants to work from home, nobody wants to make money when they're sleeping, nobody wants to grow as a person, help other people, look better, feel better and be part of a cause that helps people who can't help themselves. How can nobody be interested in that? So here's the small difference here. It's not just about going out and talking to people. You need to talk to people correctly. All right, it's like flying the plane. You just can't get in and start pushing bob <laughs> knobs and buttons. You've got to push the right knobs and buttons in the right order. Otherwise, we won't get the right outcome and we're going to crash and burn. So we need to get the message about Juness and about our products and our business from our head inside their head without any prejudice. And that's very difficult because what happens is as we deliver that message from our head, Oftentimes it seems to bounce straight off their forehead <laughs> and it bounces off their forehead because as we start talking, if we are using the wrong words, those words are triggering and they're not bypassing the anti-pyramid objection, they're not sneaking past the salesman alarm, the too good to be true detector, the be skeptical filter, don't change, don't get taken advantage of and then getting into the subconscious part of the mind where they can actually make a decision. Our message is most times not even getting to the part of the brain <laughs> where they can make a decision because we're, the words we're using are triggering all these alarms. So, piece of cake, right? Simple. When you look at it like that, you're thinking, gee, maybe, maybe I wasn't talking to the wrong people. Maybe every prospect is neutral. Maybe every prospect's not negative or positive. Maybe they're neutral and they're just having a positive or a negative reaction based on what I do and what I say. So if you say better things, you can get better results. So here's the good news. The people who are making huge money in network marketing are exactly the same as you, except when they talk to people, they just move the words around a little bit. Now let me give you an example. Let's say I'm out on a date I'm sitting across the table from a beautiful woman and I say to her, when I look into your eyes, time seems to stand still. How does that feel? How does that sound? Sounds good, right? Feels comfortable. Sounds nice. I like it. But what if I got nervous and I, or, I, or I mixed up the words a little bit and I said, when I look at your face, it would stop a clock. <laughs> it's a bit different, right? Same message, but it's said with different words, so I would get a different reaction, probably <laughs> a slap in the face. So we can use specific words that will bypass the salesman alarm, the anti-pyramid filter, the too good to be true filter, don't be taken advantage of, you know, all this sort of stuff. We can skip and bypass all of that and go straight into the subconscious mind. Now, I remember my old mentor you know, my, my personality is very black and white, straight to the point, let's get to it, let's just knock any objections on the head if there's an answer, let's just get straight to the point. And I would be on a three-way phone call with my mentor who was a million dollar producer and a prospect would ask a question and he'd go, well, and he'd go off on what seemed to be some long-winded story or a tangent and I'm thinking, what are you doing? You're going to lose it. Just get to the point, answer the question. The longer you talk, the more likely this person's going to switch off and, and you know what, and then you'd come back around and then the person would join and then the next person would join and the next person would join and I'm thinking, you know what, he's a master fisherman, this guy. He understands the psychology of people. Whereas for me, if this was about fishing, I would get a bite and go rip and I'd rip the teeth straight out of the fish's mouth and I'd just end up with a set of teeth on my hook. <laughs> or I'd get a bite and the fish would take off and I'd go, rip, snap, and all of a sudden I'd just snap the rod, snap the line, and the big fish is gone. You know, whereas a master fisherman understands that sometimes if you've got a big fish on the line and you've got the hook in its mouth, you need to let it run away, let it run away, let it run away until it's kind of ready and you start winding it a bit, it starts running away, you wind it in a bit. You know, so it's really about understanding what we're doing and having people move at the pace they are comfortable and use the words and the skills so that we can uh, help them to make a decision that they feel is in their best interest. So here's psychology of recruiting tip number one. Now here's a question for you guys. Would you like to know how to build instant rapport? Now rapport means the person feels comfortable with you, they trust you, they like you. 
And that's who people do business with. If they know you, like you, trust you, they feel comfortable, they're more likely to say yes. So we need to learn a concept called pacing. Now the way this works is we say a small fact as the first thing we come out with. And this is typically something fairly generic, something that they believe and they probably won't dispute. You know, and I'll give you some examples of this. The second thing we do is we say another fact, another one that they totally believe and it's within their comfort zone. So we give them a fact, a fact, and then a small bit of information about our product or our business. All right, so I'll give you some examples of So this is a formula that you can use and you can come up with 20, 30, 100 different little, um, little lead-ins opening statements that you can make to people when you're talking to them to bypass the salesman filter and get straight into their subconscious mind and have them mentally leaning forward and almost wanting to ask you what's next, what's this all about, give me more information. Alright, so here's an example. So I'll start with a fact. You know summer is really hard on women's skin. Alright, so that's the first fact. Most people are going to agree with it, they don't feel uncomfortable, they're probably not going to argue with it. And then the second fact is, and most women want to prevent wrinkles, but some of them have figured out a way to keep wrinkles away an extra seven to ten years. All right, so it's fact, fact, a little bit of information. So have a listen to that and see if it feels comfortable. And I'm going to roll out a few more. Just listen and see if it throws up a salesman filter or if it just feels comfortable to you. So the first one, you know, some is really hard on women's skin, and most women want to prevent wrinkles but some of them have figured out a way to keep wrinkles away for an extra seven to ten years. You know, most people work their ass off for less than they're worth and then retire a year or two before they die. But some people have worked out a way to retire ten to twenty years early on full pay. Here's another one. You know, most women would like to have a career and earn their own money, but then they feel guilty spending time away from their kids. But some women have figured out a way to earn a full-time income from home so they can do both. So what's happening is this is bypassing the salesman filters and they're going, yes, 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 I agree with that. I, 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 they almost want to jump in and add their own part of the story. Here's another one. Most people work hard all their lives and then retire with barely enough money to get by. But some people have figured out a way to retire 10 years early with more money than they could ever need. All right. So what you're doing is when you create these for yourself, you actually start off with the third sentence first. So you're thinking about the benefit that you're wanting to implant in the person's subconscious mind. So some of those examples, the benefit was about having good skin. Some other people, you could talk about the benefit of retiring early or having a secondary income or having more time. So you work out the benefit statement first, the little short bit of information, once you have that benefit, you can go back and put a couple of facts ahead of that. Okay? So that's the formula. This is something you guys can practice and you can role play with your team and uh, you'll have a lot of fun with it and you'll find some things that you're comfortable with. So the rules to using this formula are, number one is don't use first party. If you're using words that say, I have found a way to make money or I've found an amazing breakthrough product or I market this or I have discovered, immediately the salesman filter goes up right? because they feel like you've got this product and you're going to try and sell it to them or you've got this business and you're going to try and sell it to them. So those statements will trigger the salesman alarm. So don't use first party. You're not talking about you. So you talk about some people or most people and that's what you would have seen in those previous examples. You know, Most people work their whole life not getting paid what they're worth but you know, some people have actually figured out a way to retire 10 years early on full pay. Okay, so use most people, some people, you're not talking in first party, but you're also not talking in second party. Because if you start making statements like, hey, we're all fat and we all need to lose weight, listen, everybody's broke, no one's got time, you're going to start to offend people because they're going to go, well, hey, speak for yourself, don't tell me I'm broke, fat, need to exercise, <laughs> don't have any time. All right, so you can't talk in second party either. So you always talk in third party. And that's where if you use most people or some people, that will help you a lot and you won't be triggering those negative reactions. You also want to avoid multi-level marketing terminology. The minute you say six-figure income, nobody talks like that except for network marketers. Residual income, 
you know, that people don't understand those terminologies when they're working, so they only hear it from network marketers, lifestyle business or, you know, big, long um, scientific words, you know, these are things that trigger those salesman alarms. Number five is we want to avoid questions that corner people. And I've got to say, over the years I've been guilty of teaching some of these techniques where people would actually feel cornered. So an example of that would be ringing up my friend and saying, hey, what are you doing Tuesday night? Now my friend's thinking, oh, well, I'm not sure because I don't know why you're asking and I'm not sure whether to say I'm busy or I'm free. All right. So if you're going to ask a question, you need to give it some context. In other words, where if I said, hey, listen, um, I'm going to the movies on Tuesday night, are you free? Now they've got some context of why I'm asking. All right, so don't ask questions that people feel like they're being cornered because if they feel uncomfortable, then they're going to think their friends are going to feel uncomfortable, they're not going to do the business, they're not going to put their friends in front of you because they don't want their friends to feel uncomfortable either. Number six is use one small bit of information, not multiple. And this is where we often go wrong. We get overexcited because we might say, hey, you know what, in, you know, uh, in summer our skin gets really dry. You know, most women want to try and prevent wrinkles. Hey, but some of them have found a way where they can actually put the handbrake on the, on the aging process and look 10 years younger. And then if the person you're talking to is, goes, oh, really? How does that work? And you say, well, we've got this new stem cell technology. It comes from a company called Jeunesse. We just did a billion dollars in six years. We've opened 140 countries. It's unbelievable. Developed by Dr. Nathan Newman. All of a sudden, you've just thrown up all over this person. You've got the fire hose out. They ask for a little drop of water, and you've just cannonballed them <laughs> with a whole bunch of water. And now you sound like a salesperson, and those filters have gone bang. The shutters have gone up. Nobody's home. And you thought, hey, I thought they were interested. So one small bit of information. The shorter, the better. So stories are a powerful way to prevent and overcome objections. These things are so powerful and this is really um, another one of our job descriptions is that as network marketers we are highly paid storytellers. We tell stories enable to come to helping that person making a decision. People are addicted to stories. From the time we were young our parents didn't tell us bedtime facts, they told us bedtime stories. When we tell stories or when we listen to a story, we paint an image in our mind. We put up the movie projector, we start having these images in our mind because our, picture, our mind thinks in pictures. Most times we'll actually put ourselves into the story. You know, we're the hero or, or the heroine in the, in the, in the movie and the story itself. We're actually involved in it and we remember stories, all right, because we've created all these images in our mind. People are addicted to watching movies, reading books. If you walk past somebody at work and someone's going, oh, you can't believe what Mary did on the weekend, bang, they've got your attention and put your brain on stun, all right? And, uh, you know, you don't think you're being sold something, you just want to listen. You want to listen to the end of the story. How many times have you been on an aeroplane, you're watching a movie, and the pilot comes on, oh, we're going to have to put all, um, you know, uh, devices away, and you're thinking, what? What the? I don't know what happens at the end of the movie. We want to hear a story right through to the end. As soon as somebody starts to tell a story, it puts the brain on stun and listen mode. Okay, So we need to develop the ability to tell a story that stirs emotion and inspires somebody to act. There's five reasons people will say no to you. People will say no to you because in their mind, they don't have time, they don't have money, they don't trust you, they don't trust themselves, or it's too complicated. So when we tell stories, not only can we make it sound simple and the person will not be sitting there thinking you're trying to sell them something, but if people come up with any of these objections, you can tell them a short story to help them to get past their objection without feeling like you're trying to sell them. And the best way to accumulate these stories is for you to attend all of the webinars because you get to hear the different presenters' story. You need to attend all of the monthly events because you get to hear many other people's product and business stories. You need to attend the major events and the international events because you get to hear successful people's product and business stories. If you're not accumulating a library of stories, how are you going to be effective in this business? I'm going to give you a formula that you can use. This is just one simple formula to overcome objections utilizing stories. So after any objection or question, you could say this, 
here's the short story. The second you say those words, here's the short story, it puts their brain on stun and listen mode. You've automatic, automatically bypassed the salesman filter. So let's say, for example, we know people are addicted to stories and gossip and movies, and let's say the prospect says to us, so tell me how that reserve works. You say, here's a short story that puts their brain on stun. You take this and you live longer. That's it. <laughs> because the benefit, living longer, is what almost everybody wants. Here's another example. Prospect says, hey, is that one of those pyramid deals? You say, here's the short story. I don't know what those pyramid schemes are. All I know is I get an extra paycheck every month. Or the prospect says, skincare doesn't work. It's overpriced. It's just a waste of money. So you say, well, here's the short story. All I know is that most people who use it look 10 years younger. Or prospect says, i got no time. So you say, well, here's a short story. That's why I'm talking to you now. So you don't have to be that way for the rest of your life. Okay, here's another one. Prospect says, I don't have any money. So, well, here's the short story. I don't want you to be in this situation for the rest of your life. So why don't we sit down and figure out a way to get you started? All right, so using this formula can help you to, number one, put the prospect at ease bypass their, their sales filter, like you're trying to convince them, and then plant a benefit in their mind, directly into the subconscious mind, that they actually want. Okay. okay. Prospect says, I tried network marketing before and it didn't work. You say, well, here's a short story. This time you get to work with professionals who keep it simple and you get to succeed. Would you like me to show you, like me to show you what the next step is? Okay, so let's have a look at five lessons from the limo driver. A story, if you're taking notes, you need to take notes because this is a story, you'll remember it, you'll be able to tell it tomorrow, and I suggest you do tell it tomorrow because number one, it's funny, and number two is if you tell a story within the next 24 hours, you will most likely remember it. So here's the story. There's a guy who drives a limousine for a, a really high-end professor, and this professor has to go around the United States and deliver a keynote speech to medical students all around the country. And so every time this professor goes in and delivers his speech to all these medical students, the limo driver will go in, he sits up the back, and he listens to the professor deliver his speech. It's a two-hour speech. Lots of complicated words, medical terminology, and it's just unbelievable. So after he's been all around the country and they've been to all these different towns and cities and different places and all these different schools and universities, one day they're driving along and the limo driver turns to the professor and says, listen, professor, I've listened to you deliver that speech now, I think 50 or 100 times. In fact, I've listened to you deliver it so many times, I'm pretty confident that I could actually give that speech. And the professor says, really? Are you sure of that? And the limo driver says, I'm 100% I'm sure. And the professor says, well, if you're so sure, next week, uh, next time we're supposed to deliver this um, is at the Harvard Medical School. If you want to, we've got a ha uh, 100 medical students from Harvard. You can get up, uh, you can dress up like me. I'll dress up like you as the driver and I'll sit up the back and you can deliver the speech. And the limo driver says, yes, I can do it, absolutely. Let, let's give it a go. So they get in there. The limo driver gets up the front. He starts delivering the speech and he does an amazing job. He knocks it out of the park and the whole crowd just up erupts. It's amazing. Everyone loves it. And of course, then there's one smart aleck. There's always one smart aleck in the audience who has to think they've got to try and one up the speaker. So this person, the student, puts up his hand and he asks the most difficult, convoluted, long winded question you could ever think of. And the limo driver, he's standing up there and he looks at the student and he says, You know what? That question is so easy, I'm going to let my driver answer this one. <laughs> and he points to, obviously, his driver up the back who's dressed up as a limo driver. So what's the five lessons from the limo driver? The first lesson is listen to the expert. If we're in this business and we're not turning up to the monthly events, we're not hearing the story 
from the experts. If we're not getting on the webinar, we're not hearing it from the experts. If we're not doing three-way phone calls with our prospects and putting them onto our upline leaders, we're not hearing how they answer prospects' questions. We're not hearing how they tell their story, how they tell their product story, how they use stories to answer the questions and objections. So number one is we need to listen to the expert and we need to be doing it regularly and over and over and over again. The second lesson is exactly that. We need to be not just listening, but listening over and over and over. You know what, well, I learn something new every single webinar that I go on to and every single event I go on to and I've been to a lot, all right? Number three thing we've learned from the limo driver is that we can defer questions to the expert. We don't have to know everything before we go and start talking to prospects. The minute a prospect asks us a question, we can say, you know what, it's a great question. I'll send you a video that covers how those stem cells work, or I'll send you to a webinar which will explain all that, or I'll send you a video that explains the compensation plan, or that's a great question. Why don't we hook up a three-way phone call where I can introduce you to my business partner and they can explain that answer to both of us at the same time. So by deferring questions to the expert, number one, you don't feel fearful to go and talk to people in case you look silly, but number two, you're actually showing the prospect that they can also do the business without having to be a product expert or a salesperson. So you're actually empowering your prospect to think, I can do this, the more you defer people. So human nature says that, oh, if we don't know the answer, we look silly, and we want to be the hero and the expert. No, the people who do the best refer questions to a three-way phone call or to a tool or to an event. The fourth thing we learn is that people learn through stories. All right, I just told you the story about the limo driver. You guys can remember it, you can repeat it tomorrow, and then you'll have it stuck in your mind forever. But the fifth thing is that people learn through humor. You know, remember the bus driver having fun? You know, we're not here to goof off, we need to be professional. But you know, you can also have fun, because if people are laughing, they're listening, and when they're laughing, all their barriers are down, and they're learning and the information's going in. So here's another tip on how to slip past the salesman filter. Step one, when you're talking to people, you can ask them a question, but it's a short and it's a prepping question. It's preparing them for the real question you want to ask them. So a prepping question could be along the lines of, do you like taking care of your appearance? You know. Now, it can't just be um, a question with no context. So that would be like what I was talking about before, which would be like saying, hey, what are you doing Tuesday night? There's no reference, okay? so. Do you like taking care of your appearance? Gives them the context of it's about you know their appearance. Or another question would be, do you like earning money? Or would you see yourself as somebody who's health conscious? So these are prepping questions, which once you get the answer of yes, you would then go to the second question. Okay, so you can bring in the second question beginning with five magic words. These five magic words have the person's subconscious mind saying, yes, yes, give it to me, I'm having it, I'd love it, come on, let's get going, before they even know what it is. It's quite amazing. So you've led with a prepping question, and um, you know, would it be okay with you guys if I shared these five simple words with you? That programs 97% of people subconsciously to say yes before they even know what the question is. Would it be okay if I shared that with you guys? Yes? Great. Well, those are the five magic words. Would it be okay if? Okay, I'm going to give you some examples of that. You start your second question with, would it be okay if? 97% of people will subconsciously be saying yes and feeling yes and comfortable before you even ask the question. So here's some examples. The prepping question would be like, do you like taking care of your appearance? Yeah, why? Well, would it be okay if I shared some anti-aging skincare products that help you put the handbrake on the aging process? Or, do you like making money? Yeah, sure, who doesn't? Well, would it be okay if I showed you how you can get more? <laughs> or, do you like your job? No, I hate it. Why? Well, would it be okay if I showed you how you could escape? <laughs> All right, here's another one. Do you like the idea of making money or income from other people's efforts? Sure, why? Well, would it be okay if I shared a short video with you how you could do that? 
So you're programming them to get to the point in their brain where they can actually make a decision without feeling like they're being sold to. Those five magic words, write them down, would it be okay if? You'll be surprised how far that will get you. Now before we get onto five words not to use, you need to understand something about the would it be okay. When you start using these words, for you it might feel a little bit weird or different. But communication isn't really about how you're feeling so much as how the prospect is feeling. If you say those words in a, in a role play environment with some of your team members and you ask them, well, how did it feel when I say that? They say, yeah, I feel good. I, I liked it. I felt comfortable. So that we need to understand that when we're trying something new and different, we might feel new and different, weird, uncomfortable even. But it's about what is the prospect feeling because remember we don't want the word to be bouncing off the prospect's forehead and us feeling great about it but we're not helping them to make a decision because it's not even getting to the part of their brain where they can make a decision. So five words not to use. Would you be interested in? The minute you say those words, would you be interested in? No, you're trying to sell me something. All right. Do not say those words. Can if you want but you'll be dead, it activates the salesman response. I just got involved in, dead, <laughs> so the shutters are gone up, roadkill, dead, over and done with, or I'm launching a new business, dead, <laughs> or I have a ground floor, dead, <laughs> or I've just come across a breakthrough, dead. These are things that will just trigger, like you wouldn't believe, and throw up the red flags, people to shut off straight away. It's here coming a mile away. So that's it, guys. I hope that's been helpful. Now you can take these formulas. You can take these words. Um, thanks very much for your time. I want you to go out. I want you to practice these, and I want you to have fun. I hope that's been helpful, and we look forward to seeing you at an event very soon.